Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But, ugh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a stepdame or a dowager long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in nights. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then, the moon, like to a silver bow new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Philostrate. Yes, my lord. Go, stir up the Athenian youth to merriment. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Noble Theseus, I will. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing thee injuries. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I with a complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. My gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes that exchange love tokens with my child. Thou hast by her moonlight window sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, necks, gods, conceits, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of prevailment in unhardened youth. With cunning hast thou filched away her heart and turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so she will not hear before your grace, consent to marry with Demetrius, I will beg the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which is either to this gentleman here, or to her death, according to the law immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Uh Bear in mind, young maid, you, to you your father should be as a god, one who composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax by him imprinted, and within his power to either leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. 
know of your youth. E examine well your blood, whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. Thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage, but earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So I will grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause. And by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship, upon that day either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for I austerity in single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander yield thy crazy title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? <laughs> <laughs> Stornful Lysander. True. He hath my love. And what is mine, my love shall render him. And as she is mine, all my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. I am my lord as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortune's every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage, as Demetrius's. And which is more than all of these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should I not then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nadar's daughter, Helena, and won her heart. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof. But being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. As for you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate, either to death or to a vow of single life. Come, my Apolita. What cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we follow you. How, how now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Like for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. I, me, for aught that I could ever read or hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. But either it was different in blood. Ah, oh, cross, too high to be enthralled to low. Or else Miss Graft in the respective years. Oh, spite, too old to be engaged to young. Or else it stood upon the chance of friends. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Or, if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it as momentany as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the collied night, which in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quickly bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love is thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancies, followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is remote her house seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood a league without the town, a place where we did meet once with Helena to do observance to a morn of May, there I will stay for thee. My good Lysander, 
I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke in number more than ever women spoke, <laughs> in that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly I will meet with thee. He promised love. Look, here comes Helena. Godspeed, fair Helena, with her way. Call you me fair? <laughs> that fair again, I'm say. Demetrius loves your fair, oh happy fair. Your eyes are loath stars, and your tongue sweet air more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, sickness is catching. Oh, won't favor so. Yours would I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue, sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motions of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love that your prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. <laughs> None but your beauty would that fault were mine. Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself shall fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Ah, uh, then what graces in my love do dwell that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. Helen, to your minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time when lover's flights doth still conceal, through Athens gates we have devised to steal. And in the wood, where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds, were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet. And thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. I will, my love. Helena, adieu. As you dote on him, Demetrius, dote on you. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all that he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. Wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste, and therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled, as waggish boys in games themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine, and when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then will he to the woods tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. <laughs> Is all our company here? You were to do best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. 
Uh, here is the scroll in which every man's name is thought to fit through all of Athens to play in the interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day and night. First, good Peter Quince, stay with the play in treats, and then name the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and the most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Very good piece of work, and Mary, I assure you. <laughs> Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors. Masters, spread yourselves. <clears throat> Answer as I call you, uh, Nick Bottom the Weaver. Here, name what part I am for and proceed. <clears throat> Nick Bottom, you are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus, a lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself in the most gallant for love. <laughs> That will ask who hears in the performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. Yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Heracles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in, to make all split. And the raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break locks of prison gates. Amphibious's car shall shine from afar and make and mar the foolish fates. This was foolish. Now, good Peter Quince, say the names of the actors. This is Heracles' vein, the tyrant's vein, the lover's more condoling. <clears throat> Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quince. Francis, you shall take this be on you. <laughs> What, what is this be? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. <laughs> nay, faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. It is all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you can speak as little as you will. <laughs> and I may hide my face so that I may be Thisbe too. Oh, I will speak in a monstrous little tone. Thisney, Thisney, I am my dear. No, no, no. Nick Bottom, you must play Pyramus, and Francis Flute, you must play Thisbe. Well, proceed. <clears throat> Robin Starveling, the tailor. Uh, here, Peter. Robin, you are set down for Thisbe's mother. Uh, Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You are set down for Thisbe's father, and I am set down for Pyramus's father. A snug the journey, you shall play the lion's part. And I think that is a play thing. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it me, for I'm slow of study. You may do it extend for, for it is only roar. And I may play the lion too. I will roar, and it will do any man's heart good to hear me. Roar, and the Duke will say, let him roar again, let him roar again. And you should do it horribly. You would frighten the duchesses and the ladies so much that they would shriek, and that would be enough to hang us all. That would hang us every mother's son. Son. I grant you, friends, if you were to scare the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will activate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. And I will roar you and twer any nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus. For Pyramus is the sweet-faced man, a, a proper man that you shall meet on a summer's day. The most lovely, gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. <laughs> I will undertake it. What beard am I to play it in? Why, what you will. I will discharge it in your straw-colored beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrain beard, or your French crown beard, your perfect yellow. Some French crowns have no hair at all, and then you play it barefaced. 
Masters, here are your parts. I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to come then by tomorrow night. By the palace wood we will meet, by the city by moonlight. For if we meet in the city, we will be dogged with company, and our devices known. In the meanwhile, I will draw up a bill of properties such our play wants. I pray you fail me not. And there we will meet, and we will rehearse most obscenely and courageously. <laughs> Take pains, be perfect. I do. At Duke's Oak, we meet. Enough older cut bowstrings. Now, spirit, whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, through rush, through wire, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire, I do wander everywhere, stood within the moon's sphere. And I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall, her pensioners be, in their gold coats, spots you see. Those be rubies, fairy favors, in their freckles, their lives, their sabers. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob spirits, I'll be gone. The queen and her elves, come here anon. The king doth keep his revels here tonight. Take heed the queen come not within his sight, for Oberon is passing fell and wrath. Because that she, as her attendant, hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling. A jealous Oberon would have the child, knight of his train, to trace the forest's wild. But she perforce withholds the loved boy, treats him with flowers, treats him all her joy, and now they never meet in grove or green, by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen. They do square, then all their elves for fear, creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Either I mistake your shape in making quite, or else... You are that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are not you she that frights the maidens of the villagery, skim milk, and sometimes labor in the corn? And bootless make the breathless housewife churn, mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm? Those that hobgoblin call you and sweet puck, you do their work and they shall have good luck. Are not you she? Thou speakest aright. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest you over on and make him smile when I a fat and bean-fed horse beguile, me in the likeness of a filly foal. And sometime look I in a gossip's bowl, in very likeness of a roasted crab. And when she drinks against her lips, I bob, and on her withered dewlap pour the ale, the wisest aunt telling the saddest tale. Sometime, a three-foot stool mistaketh me, then slip I from her bum down, topple she, and Taylor cries and falls into a gulf, and the whole choir hold their hips and lop, and waxen in their mirth, and knees and swear, a merrier hour was never wasted there. Oh, but room, fairy, here comes over on. And here my queen. Would that he were gone? Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What? Jealous, Oberon! Fairies, skip hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Tarry, rash wanton. Am I not thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. But I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland and in the shape of corn sat all day playing on pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Philida. Why art thou here, come from the farthest steep of India, but that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your buskined mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity? How can thou thus for shame, Titania? Glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus. These are the forgeries of jealousy. And never, since the middle summer spring, met we on hill, dale, forest, or mead, by paved fountain, or by rushy brook, or by the beached margent of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. 
but with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge, have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which, falling in the land, have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. Old stands empty in the drowned field, crows are fatted with a murian flock. The nine men's morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green, for lack of tread, are undistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough this distemperature, we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose and on old Hyam's thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set. The spring, the summer, childing autumn, angry winter change their wanted liveries, and the mazed world by their increase knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension, we are their parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not the child of me. This mother was a votress of my order. In the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarked traders of the flood. We have laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big bellied in the wanton wind, which she, with pretty and with swimming gait, following her womb then rich with my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land. Fetch me trifles and return again as if run him a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal of that boy, did die, and for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus's wedding day. If you will patiently dance an hour round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me the boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away. We shall chide downright if I longer stay. We'll go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle Puck, come hither. Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory and saw a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to see, hear the sea maid's music. I remember. At that very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid, all armed, a certain name he took, at a fair vestal throned by the west, and loosed the love shaft smartly from his bow as if to pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial vestal fast on in maiden meditation fancy free, but marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me this flower, the herb I showed thee once, 
The juice of it on sleeping eyelids made laid will make man or woman madly dote on the next living creature it sees. Fetch it me and be here, be thou here ere the Leviathan can swim a lead. I'll put a girdle around about the earth in forty minutes. <laughs> Having once this juice, I'll watch to Tanya when she is asleep, and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing she waking looks upon, be it lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, or meddling monkey, or busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can do it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible and will overhear their conference. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where's Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay and the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and now here am I in wood within this wood because I cannot meet my Hermia. Therefore get thee gone, follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not fire, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you that I do not, nor cannot love you? And even for that do I love you the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. What worse or place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog? Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much. To leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not? To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity? Your virtue is my privilege. For that it is not night when I do see your face, therefore I think I am not in the night. Nor doth this wood lack worlds of company, for you in my respect are all the world. Then how can it be said that I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee, and hide me in the brakes, and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. The wildest hath not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies and Daphne holds the chase. The dove pursues the griffin, the mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger. Bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valor flies. I will not stay thy questions. Let me go. But if thou follow'st me, do not believe but I shall do thee mischief in this wood. I, in the temple, in the town, in the field, you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. Oh, we should be wooed and we're not made to woo. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell to die upon that hand I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Aye, there it is. I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where the oxlips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. And there the enameled snake throws her skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. 
take thou some of it. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it, when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Effect it with some care, that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And meet me here ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. <laughs> fairy song, then to your offices and let me rest. You spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen. Newts and blind worms do no wrong, come not near our fairy queen. Philomel with melody, sing our sweet lullaby, never harm nor spell nor charm. Come, our lovely Lady Nye. Weaving spiders, come not here. Hence, you long-legged spinners, hence. Beetles black, approach not near. Worm nor snail, do no offense. Hence, away, now all is well. One aloof stand sentinel. <laughs> what thou see when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, hard or boar with bristled hair, in thy eye that shall appear, when thou wakest, it is thy dear. <laughs> Wake when some vile thing is near. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood. And to speak a troth, I have forgot our way. <clears throat> we'll rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander, find you out of bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head. One turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one troth. Nay, good Lysander, for COVID's sake, my dear, lie further off yet. Do not lie so near. <coughs> Take the sense, sweet of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchained with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single troth. Then by your side, no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But, gentle friend, for love and courtesy, lie further off in human modesty. Such separation, as well may be said, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant. And good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet life end. Amen. Amen to that fair prayer I say, and end life when I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Sweet life, give thee all his rest. With half that wish, the wisher's eyes be pressed. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none. On whose eyes I might approve this flower's force and stirring love. Light and silence, who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despises the Athenian maid. And here the maiden, sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul, she durst not lie with this lack love, this kill courtesy. Turl, upon thy eyes I throw all this power, this charm doth owe. When thou wakest, let love forbid, sleep his seat on thy eyelid. So awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. Oh, stay, 
Though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou leave me? Do not say so. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. <sighs> I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not through salt tears. If so, mine are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me do run away for fear. Therefore no marvel, though Demetrius do as a monster fly my presence thus. What wicked and dissembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's sphery eye? But who is here? Lysander? On the ground? Dead or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. <laughs> There were bells on the hill, but I never heard them ringing. No, I never heard them at all, till there was you. And run through fire, I will, for thy sweet sake. Oh, transparent Helena. Nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where's Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword? Oh, do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What, though he loves your Hermia? Lord, what though? Hermia loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? No, I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who would not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says thou art the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season, and so I, being young, till now ripe not to reason. And touching now the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will. And leads me to your eyes, where I doth o'erlook, Love's stories written in love's richest book. Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve this scorn? It's not enough, it is not enough, young man, that I did not know, nor never can, deserve a sweet look from Demetrius's eye, but you must flout my insufficiency? Katroth, you do me wrong, good sir, you do in such disdainful manner me to woo. But fare you well, perforce I must confess I thought you a lord of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused should have another therefore be abused. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayest thou come Lysander near. Or as a surfeit of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings. Or as the heresies that men do leave are hated most of those that they did deceive. So thou, my surfeit and my heresy, be thou hated, but the most by me. And all my powers address your love and might to honor Helen and to be her knight. Help me, Lysander, help me. Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. <sighs> I me for pity. What a dream was here. Lysander, look how I do quake with fear. You thought a serpent ate my heart away and you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander, what removed? Lysander, Lord! What, out of hearing gone? No sound, no word? 
Alack, where are you? Speak, and if you hear. Speak of all loves, I swoon almost with fear. No? Well, then I will perceive you are not nigh. Either death or I find you immediately. We all met. At that, here is a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. Uh, this green plot of land shall be our stage, this Hawthorne break, our tiring house, and we'll do the action as we do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are some things in this comedy, Pyramus and Pyramus, that we'll not do. First, uh, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. <laughs> I'll answer you that. Fire lock a perilous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue, and let the prologue state that we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, bottom believer. Uh, this will put this will ease them out of fear. Such a prologue shall be written, and it shall be written in eight and six. <laughs> oh, now make it do more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? I fear it. I promise you, oh, gentlemen. You ought to consider with yourselves to bring in, God shield us, a lion amongst the ladies is a most dreadful thing. For there is not a more fearful wildfowl than your lion living. And we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must be written to say that he's not a lion. Nay, you must name his name and his face must be seen through the neck of the lion, and he himself must speak thus, or th to some defect. Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or fair ladies, I would entreat you not to fear, not to tremble my life for yours. If you think I were to come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life, no. I am no such lady. I am but a man as other men are. And let him name his name as Snug the Joiner and let him speak plainly. Shall be done. But, but there is two hard things. Uh, that is to bring the moonlight into the chamber. For we all know that Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine the night of our play? A calendar, a calendar. Look in your almanac and find out moonshine. Find out moonshine. Uh, yes, it does shine that night. Uh, then uh, leave a casement in that great chamber window where we play open, and the moon may shine through the casement. Aye, or else one must come in a bush full of thorns holding a lantern, saying he comes to present, or the person of moonshine. But there is uh, another thing. That is to bring a great wall into the chamber for Pyramus and Thisbe, uh, says the story, uh, speak through the chink of a wall. Can never bring in a wall. Bottom what you say. Some man or other must present wall. Let him have some loam or some plaster or some rough cast about him to present wall. And let his arms be thus, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. That may be, then all is well. Uh, now come, sit down, every mother, son, and rehearse your lines. Uh, Pyramus, you begin. When you have speech, enter into the break. And so everyone according to his line. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What, a, a play tour? I'll be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Speak Pyramus, uh, Thisbe stand forth. My dearest Thisbe, 
I only a shave of sweet. Odors. 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 Savor sweet, and by a hark, uh, by your health, uh, dear Thisbe. Uh, but hark, I hear a voice. Stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger pyramus than e'er played here. Must I speak now? Ay, Mary, must you, that for you must understand that he goes but to see a sound that he has heard that it is to come again. O oh, most noble Pyramus, most lily white of hue, of color <coughs> like... <coughs> <coughs> oh, most noble Pyramus, most lily white <laughs> of color like the red rose on triumphant briar, as true as truest horse that yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninus tomb, man, why well, you must not speak that yet. You wait for Pyramus to answer. You say your part all at once, cues and all. <clears throat> Enter Pyramus, your past cue, never tire. Oh. As true as truest horse that yet would never tire. <laughs> oh, monstrous, those strange we are haunted. Pray, masters, fly, masters, help. If, uh, if I were fair, fair Thisbe, Thisbe, I were only thine. I'll follow you, I'll lead you about around, through bush, through bog, through brake, through briar. Sometimes a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire. And neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. <laughs> Why do they run away? Ah, this is a name that can make me a fear. O oh, bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? What do you see on me? Do, do you see an ass head of your own, do you? Blessed to thee, bottom. Blessed to thee. Thou art translated. I see their name. This is to make an ass out of me, if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they will. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing so that they will hear that I am not afraid. <clears throat> Country road, take me home to the place where I belong. Where's Virginia? Oh, mama. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? Take my home. Control. <laughs> yes, indeed, I would like to go home one of these days. <laughs> I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored to thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on first view to say, to swear I love thee. Me, mistress, you should have had little reason for that. <laughs> but then again, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. <laughs> All the more reason that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Nay, I can gleek upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so neither. But if I had wit enough to serve mine own turn, I had wit enough to get out of this wood. <laughs> How does this wood do not desire to go? Thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. Summer still doth tend upon my state, and I do love thee. Therefore, go with me. 
I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness so that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom, cobweb, mustard seed, and sneeze were ready. And I. And I. And I. Where shall we go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots, <laughs> berries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humble bees, and for night tapers crop their waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes to have my love to bed and to arise. Pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Not to him, elves, do him courtesies. <laughs> Hail. Hail. Ah, hell. <laughs> Pray your worship's mercy heartily. I, I, I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb. Good mistress Cobweb, I shall desire of you more acquaintance. If I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, honest fairy maid? Peace Blossom. Good mistress Peace Blossom, I shall desire of you more acquaintance as well. But your name, good monsieur? Mustard Seed. Good master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly giant like Oxbeat hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. <laughs> I pray you, your kindred hath made my eyes water ere now. <laughs> And I, good sir, and Mistress Sneezewort. Come, wait upon him. Lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my lover's tongue. Bring him silently. <laughs> I wonder if Titania be awaked, then what it was that next came in her eye, which she must dote on in extremity. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit, what night rule about this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love, <laughs> near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour. Crew of patches, rude mechanicals that worked for bread upon Athenian stalls were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus's nuptial day, when the shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, <laughs> and has his all I fixed upon his head, <laughs> and on his thisbe must be answered. And forth my mimic comes, when they him spy as wild geese that the creeping fowler eye. <laughs> the pack coughs, many in sort, rising and cawing at the gun's report. Seven themselves, and madly sweep the sky, so at his sight away his fellows fly. And at our stamp here, o'er and o'er one falls, him murder cries, and hope from Athens calls. <laughs> their fears thus strong, made senseless things begin to do them wrong. For briars and thorns at their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats, some yielders, all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there. <laughs> and in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked. And straight away loved an ass. <laughs> I do. <sighs> this falls out better than I could devise. 
But hast thou latched the Athenian's eyes with the love juice, as I bid thee do? I took him sleeping, mad is finished too. And the Athenian woman by his side, that when he wakes, of course she must be eyed. Stand close. This is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. Why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse, for thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain thy sander in his sleep, being o'er shoes and blood, plunge in the deep and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon this whole earth may be bored, and that the moon may through the center creep, and so displease her brother's noontide with the Antipodes. It cannot be, but thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look so dead, so grim. So should the murdered look, and so should I, pierced to the heart by your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, Look as bright and as clear as yonder Venus on her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, oh, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him to me? I had sooner give his carcass to my hounds. Dog, out, cur, thou drivest me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. Oh, once tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Durst thou have looked upon him being awake? And hast thou killed him sleeping? Oh, brave touch! Cannot a worm, an adder, do so much? An adder did it, for with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent, never adder stung. You spend your passions on a misprized mood. I'm not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead, for all that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could... What should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more. And from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more whether he be dead or no. There's no following her in this fierce vein. Here therefore for a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow. For death that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow, which now in some slight measure will pay, if fur is tender, here I make some stay. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite, and laid the love juice on some true love's sight. Of thy misprison must perforce ensue a true love turned, and not a false turn true. Then fate to rules. That one man holding troth a million fail, confounding oath on oath. About the wood go, swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens look thou find. A fancy six she is in pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. By some illusion see thou bring her here, I'll charm his eyes against she do appear. I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than an arrow from Cupid's bow. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink an apple of his eye, when his love he doth espy, make her shine as gloriously as Venus of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Captain of our fairy band, Helena is here at hand, and the youth mistook by me is pleading for a lover's fee. Shall we their fond pageant see? Lord, what fools these mortals be! Stand aside, the noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. And will two at once will one, that must needs be sports alone, and those things do best please me that befall preposterously. Why should you think that I should woo and scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow, I weep, and vows so born in their nativity, all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more when truth kills truth. Oh, devilish holy fray! 
These vows are Hermia's. Will you give her or? Weigh oath with oath and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to her and me put in two scales will both even weigh, both light as tails. I had no judgment when to her I swore. Nor none in my mind, now you give her or. Demetrius loves her and he loves not you. There were bells on the hill, but I never heard them ringing. No, I never heard them at all till there was you. Oh, Helen, goddess, nymph, perfect, divine. To what, my love, shall I compare thine eyne? Crystal is muddy, oh, how ripe and show thine lips, those kissing cherries tempting grow, with the congealed white high Taurus snow, fanned with the eastern wind, turns to a crow when thou holdst out thy hand. <gasps> oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. Oh, spite! Oh, hell! I see you are all bent to sin against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me, as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me, too? If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so to vow swear and super praise my parts when I know you hate me with all your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia. And now both rivals to mock Helena. A trim exploit, a manly enterprise to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort could so offend a virgin nor extort a poor soul's patience all to make things sport. You are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so. For you love Hermia, this you know I know. And now, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love I yield you up my part. And yours of Helen to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. My Sander, keep thy Hermia, I will none. If e'er I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her is like as guest wise sojourned. And now to Helen it is home returned. There Helen, it is not so. <sighs> Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to thy apparel thou will buy a dear. Look, here comes thy love. Yonder is thy dear. <sighs> thou art not by mine eye, Lysander, found mine ear. I think it brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Why should he stay whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love, who can more than bide, fair Helen, who more engilds the night than all yon fiery o's and eyes of light. Why seekest thou me? Could not this make thee know the hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think, it cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared, all the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent when we have chid the hasty footing time, oh, it's all forgot? All school days, friendship, childhood, innocence. We, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower, both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, our voices had been incorporate. And will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly, it's not maidenly. 
Our sex as well as I may chide you for it, but I alone do feel the injury. I am amazed at your words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and praise my eyes and face, and made your other love Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph, divine, and rare, precious, celestial? Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul and tender me, forsooth, affection? But by your setting on, by your consent. What, though I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most to love unloved, this you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. I do. Persevere, counterfeit sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back. Wink at each other, hold the sweet jest up. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. If you have any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare you well. Tis partly my own fault, with death or absence soon shall remedy. Stay gentle, Helena. Hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Oh, excellent. Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel no more than she entreat. Thy weak threats have no more strength than her prayers. Helen, I love thee. By my life, I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee, to prove him false that says, I love thee not. And I say, I love you more than he can do. If thou say so, then withdraw and prove it too. Oh, quick, come. Lysander, where to tends all this? Away, you toad. Oh, no, he'll seem to break loose. Take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You're a tame Hang man. Off. Thou cat, thou burr, vile thing, let loose, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent. Why are you grown so rude? What changes the sweet love? Out, love and medicine, oh, hated potion, hence. Do you not just? I sooth and so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. <sighs> I would have hand your bond. Perhaps if a weak bond holds you, I'll not trust your word. What, should I hurt her, strike her, kill her dead? Though I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What? Can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me wherefore? Oh, me, what news, my love? Uh, am not I Hermia, or not you Lysander? Uh, I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why, then you, you left me. Oh, oh, the gods forbid. In earnest, shall I say? Aye. By my life, I never did desire to see thee more. Therefore, be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain, nothing truer, that I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh, me. You juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love. What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine, in faith, have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you! Puppet? Why so? I... <laughs> that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maple? Speak! How low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach into thine eyes. Oh, I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. 
I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think, because she is something lower than myself, that I can match her. Lower! Hark again! Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia. Did keep your counsels never wronged you, save that in love unto Demetrius I told him of your flight unto this wood. He followed you, for love I followed him. But he hath chid me hence, and threatened me to strike me, to spurn me, nay, to kill me too. So you will let me quiet go. To Athens will I bear my folly back, and follow you no further. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. I get you gone. Who is it that hinders you? Why, a foolish heart that I do leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her place. Oh, when she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when we went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Little, again, nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Get gone, you dwarf, you minimus of hindering not grass maid. You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. Speak not of Helena. Take not her part. For the dust and ten, never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darest, to try who's right, of thine or mine, is most in Helena. <laughs> follow? <laughs> Nay, I'll go with thee, cheek by jowl. You, mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you, I, nor longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands are quicker than mine for a fray. My legs are longer, though, to run away. I am amazed and know not what to say. This is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest, or else commit thy neighbories willfully. Believe me, king of shadows, I mistook. Did you not tell me I would know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far blameless proves my enterprise that I've anointed an Athenian's eyes. And so I am, am I glad it so did sort. As this their jangling I esteem a sport. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. Hi, therefore, Robin, overcast the night. The starry welkin cover thou anon with drooping fog as black as Acheron, and lead these testy rivals so astray as not one come within another's way. Like to Lysander sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong. And sometime rail thou like Demetrius, and from each other tick thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep, then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property, to take from thence all error with his might, and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision. And back to Athens shall the lovers wend with league whose date till death shall never end. While well, I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy. And then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view, and all things shall be peace. My fairy lord, this must be done with haste, for night swift dragons cut the clouds full fast. And yonder shines Aurora's harbinger, at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home from churchyards, damned spirits all, that in crossways and floods have burial. 
Already to their wormy beds are gone, for fear lest they should look their shames upon. They willfully themselves exile from light, and must for I consort with black brown night. But we are spirits of another sort, and I with morning's love have oft made sport. But notwithstanding, haste, make no delay. We may affect this business yet ere day. Up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town. Goblin, lead them up and down. Here comes one. Where art thou, Brad Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, villain, drawn and ready. Where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me then to plainer ground. Lysander, speak again! Thou runaway, thou coward, art thou fled? Speak! In the bushes? Where dost thou hide their head? Thou coward, art thou bragging to the stars, telling bushes that thou looks for wars and wilt not come? Come, recreant, come now, child, all with thee with a rod. He is defiled that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice, we'll try no manhood here. <sighs> he goes before me and still dares me on. When I go where he calls, then he is gone. The villain is much faster healed than I. I followed fast, but faster he did fly. That fallen an eye on dark, uneven light. Ah, uh, I'll rest here. Ah, come thou gentle day. For if but once thou show me great gentle light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this slight. Ho, 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 coward, why comest thou not? <sighs> abide, abide me if thou darest, for well I've what thou runs before me. Shifting every place, and darest not look at me, nor, nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Follow me then to plainer ground. <sighs> Nay, then, thou mocks me. I shall buy this dear, if ever thy face I see in daylight again. <sighs> Fitness constraineth me to measure my length on this cold bed. Uh, by day's approach, look to be visited. O oh, long and tedious night, abate thy hours. Shine comforts from the east, that I may back to Athens by daylight, from these my poor company detest. And sleep, that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye, steal me a while from mine own company. Yet but three, come one more, two of both kinds makes up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad, Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Oh, never so weary, never so in woe, bedabbled with the dew and torn with briars, I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here I will rest me till the break of day. Heaven shield Lysander if they mean a fray. <sighs> On the ground, sleep sound, all apply to your eye, gentle lover, remedy. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known that every man should have his own, in your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. Man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed. Why, thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk roses in thy sleek, smooth head, and kiss thy fair, large ears. My gentle joy. There's peas blossom. <laughs> Ready. Scratch my head, peas blossom. Mm. 
Where's Mistress Cobweb? Ready. Mistress Cobweb, good mistress. Uh, get you your weapons in your hand and kill me a red-hipped humblebee on a thistle and, good mistress, bring me the honey bag. Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready. Mm, give me your knee, good monsieur. Uh, pray you leave your curtsy, good monsieur. What's your will? Nothing, good mistress, but to assist cavalry cobweb to scratch. Methinks I am to the bar, for I am a marvel's hairy about the face, and I am such a tender ass that if my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. But wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear of music. Let's hear the tongs and the horns. Or say, sweet love, what thou desirest to eat. Truly a peck of provender. I want your good dry oats. Methinks I have a desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay, truly hath no fellow. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee new nuts. I'd rather have a handful or two of dried peas. But pray you, let none of your people stir me. Have a sudden exposition of sleep come upon me. Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. So doth the woodbine, the sweet honeysuckle, gently entwist the female ivy so in rings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. <sighs> Welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity, for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool, I did upbraid her and fall out with her, for she his hairy temples had rounded with coronets of fresh and fragrant flowers, and that same dew which sometimes on the buds was wont to swell like round and orient pearls, stood now within the pretty Floriot's eyes like tears that did their own disgrace bewail. When I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience, I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straightway she gave to me, and her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairyland. <laughs> and now I have the boy, I will undo this hateful imperfection of the eyes. And Gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain. Then he, awakening when the others do, may all to Athens back again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents than is the fierce vexation of a dream. But first, I will release the fairy queen. Beest thou as wont to be, seest thou as wont to see, Dian's bud or Cupid's flower has such force and blessed power. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. Hey, Oberon, what visions I have seen! Methought I was enamored of an ass! <laughs> there lies your love. Oh, how came these things to pass? How mine eyes do loathe his visage now! Silence a while. Robin, take off his head. Titania, music call, and strike more dead than common sleep of all these five the sense. Music, oh, music such as charm and sleep. Now, when thou wakest, with thine own fool's eyes peep. <laughs> Sound, music, come, my queen. Take hands with me and rock the ground whereon these sleepers be. Now thou and I are new in amity, and will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance in Duke Theseus's house triumphantly, and bless it to all prosperity. 
There shall the pairs of faithful lovers be wedded with Theseus and all Java. Very king, attend and mark, I do hear the morning lark. Then, my queen, in silence sad, trip we after night's shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Come, oh, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came this night that I sleeping here was found with these mortals on the ground. Go, one of you, find out the forester. My love shall hear the music of my hounds. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. I was with Hercules and Cadmus once, when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta. Never had I heard such gallant chiding, for all the skies, the groves, the fountains seemed all one mutual cry. Never had I heard such musical a discord, such sweet thunder. My hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind. Judge when you hear. But soft, what nymphs are these? My lord, this is my daughter here asleep. And this Lysander. <gasps> this Demetrius is. Oh, this is Helena, old Nader's Helena. I wonder of their being here together. No doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing of our intent came here in grace of our solemnity. But speak, Aegeus, is not this the day that Hermia should give answer of her choice? It is, my lord. Good morrow, friends. Saint Valentine is past. Begin these wood birds but a couple now? Pardon, my lord. I pray you all stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world, that hatred is so far from jealousy to sleep by hate, and fear no enmity? My lord, I shall reply amazedly, half sleep, half waking, but as yet I cannot truly say how it is that I came here. But so I do think, for truly I would speak, and so I do bethink it, therefore it is. I came hither with Hermia, and our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might without the peril of Athenian law. Enough, enough! My lord, you have enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away. They would. Demetrius thereby to have defeated you and me. You of your wife and me of my consent. Of my consent that she should be your wife. My lord, fair Helen told me of their stealth. Of this their purpose hither into this wood, and I in fury followed them. Fair Helen and Fancy following me. But my good lord, I wot not by what power, but by some power it is, that my love for Hermia melted as the snow. Seems to me now like the remembrance of an idle god that in my childhood I once did dote upon. But now, all the virtue of my heart, all the, all the object and the pleasure of mine eye, is only Helena. But to her, my lord, was I betrothed, there I saw Hermia, like in sickness I did loathe this food, but as in health come to my natural tastes, I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. Hmm. Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse we more will hear anon. Aegeus, I will overbear your will. For in the temple, by and by, with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. And since the morning now is something worn, our purposed hunting shall be set aside. Away with us to Athens. Three and three, we'll hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. These things seem small and indistinguishable, like far off mountains turning into clouds. He thinks I see things with parted eye when everything seems double. So methinks, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel. Mine own and not mine own. Are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. Was the Duke not just here and bade, and bade us follow him? Yea, and my father. Yea, and Hippolyta. And he did bid us follow him to the temple. Why, then we are awake. Come, let us follow him to the temple. And by the way, let us recount our dreams.
you sent to Bottom's house? Is he come home yet? He cannot be heard of. Out of doubt, he is transported. If he come not, then the play is marred. It goes not forth, doth it? It is not possible. You have a man not, you know, all of Athens able to discharge Pyramus, but he. Huh. No, he has simply the best trait of any handicraft man in all of Athens. And the best persons, too. He is a very paramour for a sweet voice. You must say paragon. A paramour is, God shield us, a thing of naught. <laughs> Masters! Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just a second. <laughs> Masters, the duke is coming from the temple, and there are two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we had all been made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom, thus hath he escaped six pence a day in his life. He could not have escaped six pence a day. Had the duke not given him six pence a day for playing Pyramus, I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it, too. Six pence a day for playing Pyramus or nothing. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Oh, yay! Oh, bottom, oh, most courageous day, oh, most happy hour. Masters, I had to discourse wonders, but ask me not what for. If I told you I am not true Athenian, I will lay it out exactly as it fell. D tell us, sweet bottom. No, I cannot say much for all. All that I will tell you is that the Duke hath dined. Is you apparel together? New strings to your beards, new ribbons to your pumps. Uh, every man for his part and meet presently at the palace. For, well, the long and short of it is, is that our play is preferred. <laughs> In any case, let he that play Thisbe that she play the lion, not pare her fingernails, for they are to hang out as if they were lion's claws. And, and good masters, eat no onions nor garlic, for we are to utter sweet breath. And I do not doubt but to hear them say that it is a sweet comedy. No words. Away. Go away. It is strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination, all compact. But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancy images, and grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Here come the lovers, full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany hearts. More than to us waiting your royal walks, your board, your bed. <laughs> Come now. What masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our t usual manager of mirth? What revels are in hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Uh, call Philistrate. Here, mighty Theseus. Say, what abridgments have you for this evening? What masks? What music? How shall we beguile the lazy time, if not with some delight? There is a brief how many sports are ripe. Make choice of which your highness will see first. The battle with the centaurs to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. Ugh, will none of that. That have I told my love and glory of my kinsman Hercules. The riot of the tipsy Bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. That is an old device, and it was played when I from Thebes came last to Conqueror. Oh, the thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning, late deceased in beggary. Oh, that is some satire, keen and critical, not sorting of a nuptial ceremony. 
A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical. Tedious and brief. Why, that is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play, but by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious, for in all the play there is not one line apt, one player fitted, and tragical, my lord, it is, for Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water, but more merry tears the passion of loud laughter never shed. <laughs> what are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we shall hear it. No, my noble lord, it is not for you. I've heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing at all. Unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go bring them in, and take your places, ladies. gentle sweet you shall see no such thing he says they can do nothing in this kind the better we to give them thanks for nothing our sport shall be to take what they mistake and what poor duty cannot do noble respect takes it in might not merit love therefore and tongue-tied simplicity and least speak most to my capacity so please your grace the prologue is addressed let him proceed if we offend it is with our goodwill I think we should come not to offend, but uh, with uh, goodwill <laughs> to show our simple spiel that that is the true beginning to our end. Uh, consider then we come, but in despite we do not come minding to content you. <laughs> for our true intent is all for your delight. We come here not as to repent you. Uh, the actors are at hand, and by their show, you shall know all that it is you are like to know. This fellow does not stand upon points. He has written prologue like a rough colt. He knows not the stuff. A good moral, my lord, it is not enough to speak, but to speak true. <laughs> Indeed, he hath played on this prologue like a child on the recorder. A sound, but not in government. <laughs> His speech was like a tangled chain. Nothing impaired, but all disordered. Who is next? Gentles, perchance you wonder at this show. If so, wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man, if you will know, is Pyramus. This beauteous lady, this be is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall that did these lovers sunder. And through walls chink, poor souls, they are content to whisper at which let no man wonder. This man with lantern, dog, and bush of thorn presented moonshine, for by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn. To meet at Nina's tomb, there, Linus. there to woo, this grisly beast, which lion, pipe by name, 
did trusty Thisbe coming first at night scare away, or rather, did a fright? And as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion, vile with bloody mouth, did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty Thisbe's mantle slain, whereat with blade, with bloody, blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling, bloody breast. And Thisbe, tarrying in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion, moonshine, wall, and lovers twain at large discourse, while here we do remain. if the lion be to speak. No wonder, my lord. One lion may what many asses do. <laughs> In that same interlude it doth befall that I, one uh, snout by name, present a wall. And such a wall as I would have you think in granite hole or cheek in which lovers Pyramus and Thisbe are to whisper very secretly, this loam, this rough cast, this stone doth show that I am that same wall. The truth is so. And this cranny is the very hole where our fearful lovers are to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? It is the wittiest partition that ever I heard discourse, my lord. <laughs> Oh, Pyramus draws near the wall. Silence. Ah, Grimlock's night. A night with you so black. A night, night, left, a lack, lack. I fear my Thisbe's promises forgot. And thou wall, thou sweet and lovely wall. Thou wall that stands between her father's ground and mine. Thou wall, thou sweet and lovely wall. Show me thy chink through which to blink through with mine eye. Thanks, courteous wall. Joe, she'll be well for this. But see I, no cease be to I see. Wicked wall, through whom I see no bliss. Cursed be thy stones for thus deceiving me. The wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again. No, in truth, sir, you should not. <laughs> Deceiving me is this beast cue. And she is to enter, and I am to spot her through the chink. You will see it late, Pat. As I told you, yonder she comes. Oh, wall, full often hast thou heard my moans for parting, my sweet Pyramus and me. Often hath my lips kissed thy stones with hair and lime knit up in me. And I hear a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe, my love thou art, my love I think. Oh, think what thou will, I am thy lover's grace, and like Lymander, I am trusty still. Lie like Helena till the fates do kill. And not Shaffalus to Procris was so true. A Shaffalus to Procris, I to you. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. I kiss the wall's hole, not your face at all. Wilt thou at Ninny's tomb meet me right away? Ninus! Ninus tomb, meet me right away. Tide life, tide death, I come without delay. And thus I, wall, my part discharged it. And thus I, doth being so, must go. Now is the wall down between the two neighbors. No remedy, my lord. But walls are so willful to hear without warning. This is the silliest stuff that I have ever heard. The best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination then, and not theirs. If we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts in, a man and a lion. You ladies whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor may now perchance both quake and tremble here? 
Super Lion, Rough and Wild, Just Rage, Just Roar, then know that, that I, <laughs> Snug the Joiner, am Lion Fell, nor else nor Lion's Dam. Or if I should, as Lion, come into this place in strength, for pity on my life. A very gentle beast, and of a good conscience. The very best that a beast, my lord, the I ever saw. <laughs> this lion is a very fox for her valor. True, and a goose for her discretion. Uh, not so, my lord. Her valor cannot carry her discretion, as the fox carries the goose. Her discretion, I am sure, cannot carry her valor, for the goose carries not the fox. It is well. Let us leave it to her discretion, and let us listen to the moon. This lanthorn doth the horn and moon present! She should have worn the horns on her head. She is no crescent, and her horns are invisible within the circumference. Uh, this lanthorn doth the horn and moon present. Myself, the man in the moon, do seem to be. This is the greatest error of all the rest. The woman should be put into the lanthorn. How is it else the man in the moon? She dares not come there, for the candle you see is already in the sun. I am a weary of this moon. Would that she would change. It appears by her small light of discretion that she is in the wane, but yet, in, in courtesy, in all reason, we must stay the time. Proceed, moon! All that I have to say is that this lanthorn is the moon, myself, the man in the moon. This thorn puts my thorn puts, and this dog my dog! Why all these should be in the lanthorn, for all these are in the moon. But silence, here comes Fisbee. This is old Ninny's tomb. Where is my love? Ah! Well roared, lion. Well run, Fisbee. Well shown, moon. <laughs> Truly, the moon shines with a good grace. Well moused, lion. And then came Pyramus. Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee now for shining so bright. For thy thy golden gracious glittering beams, I trust to taste of truest Bisbee's sight. But stay, but spank, but mark, for night of dreadful dole is near. Eyes, do you see? How can it be? Thy mantle good, what stained with blood? Approach, ye furies fell. Oh, fate, come, come, cut thread and thrum, cut, come, quail, crush, conclude, and quell. This passion and the death of a dear friend would go near to make a man look sad. <gasps> Beshrew my heart, but I pity the man. <laughs> Wherefore, nature, didst thou lion's frame, since lion here hath deflowered my dear, which was never which is the fairest dame that ever lived, laughed, loved, and looked with cheer. Come, tears, confound. Out, sword, and wound that pap of Pyramus. Aye, that left pap where heart doth hop. And thus I die, thus, thus, thus. <laughs> Now I am dead, now I am fled. Tongue, loose thy light, moon, take thy flight. Now die, 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 die. die. No die but an ace, for he is but one. Less than an ace, man, for he is dead, he is nothing. With the help of a surgeon, he may yet recover, and yet prove an ass. <laughs> How chance Moonshine is gone before this becomes back and finds her lover? She will find him by starlight. Oh, here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Methinks she will not use such a long one for such a Pyramus. I do hope she will be brief. The note will turn the balance. Which Pyramus, which this be is the better? He for a man, God warrant us. She for a woman, God bless us. She hath spied him already with those sweet eyes. And thus she means, it. What? Asleep, my love? What? Dead, my dove? Oh, Pyramus, arise! Speak!
Squeak! Squeak! Quite dumb! Dead! Dead! A doom! <laughs> who have shore his thread of silk. Tongue, not a word. Come, trusty sword. Come, braid, my breast imbue. Ow! <laughs> and farewell, friends. Thus, this be end. Adieu, adieu. <laughs> Moonshine and Lion are left to bury the dead. Aye, and Wall, too. <laughs> no, sir, I assure you, the wall is down that parted their father's land. <laughs> uh, wouldst thou like to hear the epilogue, or perhaps a Bergamasque dance from two of our company? Uh, no epilogue, I pray you. For your play needs no excuse. Never excuse. For when the players are all dead, there need none to be blamed. But come, your Bergamask, let your epilogue alone.
shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend, if you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. Now good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. I gotta put Her Majesty back in costume first. Okay, if you want to just do it one more time. Yeah. Right and then I'll probably do a close-up on you. All right, so if we can just do that one more time, and then I swear that'll be it. Uh, excuse me. Okay, good. Glad you got that out of the way. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue, and let the prologue say that people do not... Okay, I think we can take this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. In that same... Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, never mind. Nice foot, Jones. Stand by other fairies. Right. Ready. All right, hang on a sec, Joe. Do you want never to mind, start? I gotta fight it. <laughs> Just, you can go ahead, Jen, whenever you're ready. Joe, get out. <laughs> All right. Clock Joe, over. This is a poor indeed who had set his wit to so foolish a bird. <laughs> the weirdo bandito. Oh, God. Wow. <laughs> so big, Eric. Flog as back as ache, as drooping fog as black as ache. Yeah, there we go. Green eggs and ham. Galona. Two Algonquin. Take one. Mark. Act four, scene one. Amacrami and Fitch. Take two. Marker. Um, act two, scene four. Alexander Hamilton. Take four? Yeah, I love how Shakespeare's like, uh, All right. you need something to do this? Well, I'll just put a flower in their eyes. You need it to take it away, you put a different flower. Also, I realized that I'm wearing my glasses, and last time I was not. Okay. Glasses, Lily. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, Joe, you're sorry, but Lily and Mary, you guys are Boy. <laughs> oh, good. Now the scene is fixed. I love you, Janice. Donkey. That's how my mom says. Janice, go away. And up. Oh, what visions I have seen. How these came to pass. Oh, damn it. You will know. This. Oh, I f***ed it up already. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I skipped the first line. Sweet, man. Why am I talking about that? I'm sorry. It gave me a 10 it gave me a 10% battery warning and oh, okay. you Are plugging you in? in? It's fine. It's no, it's not. <laughs> it's fine. I love not to see Ratchet is so charged and Here, miss! Here, miss, I'm gonna try here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so you may do it extempore. Oh, stop. It was me. I'm sorry. There it is. No more dinging for Davis over here. Okay. <laughs> no. no more dinging from Davis. Davis. <laughs> oh, you're still recording? Yes. That's craft services. I like the food. And you are now in love with Aaron, so don't look like you're <laughs> doubting that fact. Everything she says is music to your ears. You love her. Oh, Cut. We have to stop. I lost my little paper script. Hold up. Oh my god.
Alex's That's sound is, is gone. <laughs> <laughs> it looked really good. You're muted. Oh, I was muted. Okay, okay Ryan, you're muted. Um, so we're going to have to take that again. Um, Peter Quince, you're muted. <laughs> Oh, whoa. okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Long speech. All right, I'm putting it down. <laughs> okay, but you have to do it again. Because of Genevieve. Genevieve's a f up. No. <laughs> Portillo's. Which for everybody, do y'all like Portillo's? John hates it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I don't think John wants it. No, he doesn't. We'll, Everyone but John. Right, we'll please. get him a kale salad. Here we go to my Bye, Mr. D'Angelo. What? Tonight? We're going to the woods? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, what's, yeah. Hey, Hal, you know, I gotta, I gotta talk to you about something. Is it a good surprise? Yeah. <gasps> really? What is it? Just, you know, I'm thinking a lot. And right, right now just isn't the best time for me. You know, like in general, like yeah, I know. Yeah, I got, I, got, you know, I, got, I just got a lot going on. Yeah, okay. You know, the parents are. We all do. I got. I'm working with a, a Gius at, at, at nights, and just this is. What are you doing best. with the Gius? Don't worry about it. But this what? really just. Right no, no, now, no, just, no. Go back. What are you doing with him? Why would you hang out with him? He's so. He's, not, he's a nice guy. Okay. Hell, this isn't working. Okay. I'm done. What? What isn't? You're done with what? You can't be done. done. With you! With me? Please, I am please. the best thing that has ever happened to you, Demetrius. Okay. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah, sure. And we're supposed to leave in like an hour? Really? You can go to the woods or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm done. I'm sorry. No, not. Who cares? I'm going to Theseus about this. Oh, no. Yeah, go. Go ahead. Go oh. to Theseus. See what happens. I don't care. What do you mean you don't care? I can do, I have so much power, Demetrius. I yeah, who cares? I'm in love with Helena. That's me. Not, no, she, what's her name? Hermia. You're in love with That's me. That's the one. What do you mean the other one? There's no other one. There's one Helena, baby, one Helena. No, I don't like you, Helena. I don't. You're not as pretty as Hermia, nothing. She's the she's the one everyone in this town's after, and she's the one I'm gonna have. Cause you know what? I meet I talk to Jesus. We're gonna get married. You're gonna. And you can do whatever the hell you want, and I don't care personally. Demetrius, this isn't happening. This simply isn't <laughs> happening. Um, it's time to wake up. <laughs> pinch, pinch. <laughs> time to wake up. Wow, this is such a good prank, Demetrius. Awesome, I love it. And <laughs> <laughs>